Hi, it's Rob Moore here, and I am with Natalie Bailey. Hello. Uh, and Natalie, uh, you probably, what, a year back, bought five of my books? It was about a year ago now, yeah. Yeah, and we were doing a little deal where if you bought five of my books, you could come in the studio and, and interview me for whatever asset you wanted to create. <laughs> uh, and here we are. So I'm all yours. I believe we're talking about confidence. We are indeed. That's your special specialist subject. Or oh, let your mum's watching who's Mama. just out there. Um, Mine's not started. That's all right. Start that again. Um, yeah, so I'm all yours. Ask me anything about confidence and whatever Okay, you cool. So thanks for having me. All right. And allowing us in the studio. So hello to everybody who's watching. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my mum is watching. We are the co-founders of Bailey Enterprises Property and we do developments, commercial to resi developments, but I'm also a confidence coach, so I'm here to help you with your confidence and ask Rob some questions which will help you as well. So when people are new to property, they often don't believe in themselves and what they what they want to create. So when you're new, you have to go out and hope for the, the outcome you want. So what yeah. advice would you give to somebody to inspire confidence when they're having those doubts in the beginning? Okay, so... I think the first thing is you need to remember that every master was once a disaster and every winner was once a beginner. And I think people worry that they're not where they want to be, but no one who ever started, thank you, Kieran, brand new, was ever good at anything. No one who starts something is ever good at anything. No. Um, everyone starts from the same position. And I know that sounds so ridiculously simple, but... Why do we expect to be better than we should be? Um, humility is a great thing to learn. And doing something new puts you back into that state of humility where you have to rely on other people who have got more experience than you. And you have to follow a path that they've honoured and followed. And they're naturally ahead of you because they've been doing it longer than you. And that's the kind of, that's the way the world works. Um, the next thing is, is you can transmute confidence from one area of your life to another. Mm -hmm. So I know you're big into your fitness and gym and all that. So you go down the gym, you know, and you're confident in the gym. Yep. Well, you can take how you feel in the gym and that confidence and that body posture, that strength, that inner belief, and you can actually transfer that into different areas of your life. Napoleon Hill calls that transmutation of, of energy um, in Think and Grow Rich. So just tap into and tune into something that you've done in, in your past or presently that you're really good at. And then try and think, okay, what state, what process uh, did I go through to get good at it? The third thing is I like full immersion. So if I want to get really good at something, I realise it's not the amount of years I've been in it, it's the amount of hours I've put in. Mm -hmm. And some people put an hour a week into things. Well, if you put an hour a week in over a year, you might get half decent, but if you put 30 hours a week in, in two weeks, you've done the same as you, what you would have done in the year. Yep. So if you really want to get ahead quickly, whether it's buying a property for the first time, we're doing that seven day no money down challenge at the moment. People will get no money down deals in seven days that haven't done a no money down deal in two years because they will put five, six hours a day in instead of five, six hours a week. Mm -hmm. So I, I really do believe it in full immersion. Um, also, like, it's really exciting and fun and new and when you start something new you don't know all the shit that's coming you know you don't know how hard it's going to be and we're always looking to be better or further down the line but I mean if I think about the first year Mark and I got into property it really was one of our best years and it was one of our most exciting times we bought 20 properties and I didn't really know what I was doing I was learning on the job and if we all think about the things that we're good at now that first year, like dating for the, the yeah. first year you went dating. I mean, that was pretty exciting for me. Um, if a girl got within 20 yards of me, it was pretty exciting. Um, so going back to that, that, like, enjoy it being new and you not yet being great at it. Because when you're great at something, you've seen everything go wrong. You've seen all the downsides. You've seen all the challenges. And sometimes when people have been doing things for a long time, they're quite beat down, they're quite negative, they're quite sceptical because they've seen so much. Mm -hmm. So I'd say they're the sort of four main things for people to get started. Also, um, get around people who've done it, get a mentor, um, make sure that you're held accountable by people to get the right education um, because I think some conventional wisdom states, oh, well, you know, if you want to do something, something doing properly, do it yourself or... 
Um, you know, it's best to learn from your mistakes. Well, I think if you want something doing properly, get someone better than you to do it. And I think it's better to learn from someone else's mistakes than your own. So find someone who's been there and done it and it can be your like mentor if you like. And you will go on a much quicker journey towards success and results and you will be a beginner in, a, um, in much less time. That makes so much sense. That's why we have mentors and that's why I'm always on your case. It's <laughs> 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 like, oh, Natalie again. Um, <laughs> one of the things I also find, people are like often very, very insecure in what they're doing because they're not prepared. They need more information. They feel like they've got to get everything together like they need all the information before they can go out and do the thing. And obviously your book, Start Now, Get Perfect Later, goes completely against that. So it's just... Well, no one ever has all the information ever. No. It's impossible to have all the information ever. Even if you're a pilot and you get as much information as you can, the wind can change when you fly. Mm -hmm. No one ever has all the information. So start now, get perfect later. Stop being so much of a perfectionist and expecting everything to be ready and perfect before you start. Because you'll never start. And usually that's procrastination linked to fear of failure, fear of looking stupid in front of people. Um, a lot of stuff along the way I've figured out. Yeah, I figured out some stuff before I started. But a lot of what works in business and life, you figure out as you go, not before you go. And if you try and figure it out before you go, you never even pass go. You, everyone wants to collect £200, don't they? So, But can you think of a time where you have been... Doubting yourself. Every day. Every day. But it's turned out to be useful for you. Yeah, I mean, the good thing about doubting yourself is that it makes you study harder. It puts you into that state of humility, which I think is a better learning state than arrogance or overconfidence. Yeah. Um, it gets you to just check and de-risk and um, analyse a little bit more. So, you know, people are like trying to get rid of doubt, but doubt serves. All human emotions serve a purpose, otherwise we wouldn't feel them. So risk aversion and, and doubt and fear serve to make us humble, to get us better educated, to dot the I's and cross the T's, just to you know, check for any risk or um, danger that's coming. And that could be um, you know, in your general life or it could be in your business life. Yep. Um, so I think a lot of people are trying to sort of either get rid of fear. They think they can get rid of fear by being happy, clappy and positive. Or they're always dancing around fear. And of course, people call that being in your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that like you, the question is alluding to, that, that those fears and doubts serve those purposes. Yeah, because if you don't get out of your comfort zone, you're not learning or growing, are you? Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, I tend to set up my life so that I live comfortably, whether it's retired or semi-retired or systemized or, or doing things that I'm, I feel... Excuse me, I'm really coming down with something in my throat. <coughs> Bob's been having a really good morning. Uh, <laughs> all right, you know, these things happen. So, yeah, I, there's nothing wrong with setting up systems and processes to be more comfortable. Yeah. Like, I know how much I like to travel and I, like, I know how much is over-travelling. I like, know how much I like to work and how much is overwork or underwork. Mm -hmm. But I do find when I get comfortable, my growth does stye me and it does hit a ceiling. And the only really way to bust through that ceiling is to get yourself uncomfortable, which is to take on more work or to learn something new and hard um, or to take a, a slightly increased risk. Um, I mean, the quote I'm probably the most known for is if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. The reason I was like not I was reticent just to go, yeah, and agree with you is because I think you've got to balance risk and uncomfort. Because if you do something that's too uncomfortable, it actually can go the other way. Because mm -hmm. we've all got a bit of emotional scarring, probably, from things that have happened to us in the past. Big things and small things. But emotional scarring, which now produces triggers where we react to a situation that's not linked to that event, but the, the triggers occur. Uh, because we had strong emotional events as mm -hmm. we were growing up. So if you take massive risks and say you go bust or you never say, yeah, yeah, get uncomfortable and you do stupid things, all you're going to do is create these huge really strong emotional responses that are going to trigger each time something like that happens or remind you of that and you're probably going to um hold back self yeah you're going to hold back yeah. self-sabotage there's going to be like this little um force field bubble wrap protection around you but yeah. actually that makes you um take even less risks so i'm a big believer in constant and never-ending incremental increase in risk not massive increase in risk um, and yes, constantly getting uncomfortable, but comfortably uncomfortable. 
that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Do you do the same in personal and business life? Because I find that people can be very different, like on stage to off stage. I met a lady the other day and she said to me, you're exactly the same as you are online. I don't know why I thought you wouldn't be. But I find that often people are, they put one image out to the public and then in personal life they're very, very different. Mm, I think that could take a lot of thought. I like to think that um, what you see is what you get with me and what, how I am. I mean, you've seen me behind the scenes and you've seen me mentoring and going out in um, evenings at mentoring and on stage and off stage. Mm -hmm. So you and others could judge more than me. I like to think that the way I talk to people, treat people, my language, how I dress, how I speak, how I address people, my, I guess, I perceive myself as fairly honest. I share a lot of things that are going on in my life. I do that on stage as well as off stage. So I like to think that they're all consistent. But to a certain degree, there's certain things you probably have to protect. And there's certain things you probably can't say in, in the public. And, and I probably haven't got that good a filter on that because I tend to blurt a lot of things out. So, yeah, I would say I'm probably 90, 95%. What you see is what you get and it's the same across all areas. And there's not this massive change. Like, like something I don't really like is when speakers are all proud and... Um, powerful on stage and they don't want to know and don't want to talk to you or they create this persona but then they're not really that accessible but at the same time um, I went to see Justin Rose again this weekend with my son and Justin Rose is the world number four golfer and he's, he, he's played a round of golf for five and a half hours he's bogeyed the last and he has to spend two hours signing autographs cool. and then he's, got, he's speaking to me and Bobby and he, 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 when you've had a bogey on the last and you've had a five and a half hour round, you probably just want to go in and sit on, by, by yourself yeah. for a bit. Collect your thoughts. Yeah, and then you've got to go and do two hours of, of interviews. And I really respect and admire people who do that. Now, I know you could say, look, well, that's their position of authority and they get paid and all of that. And I agree with that. Mm -hmm. But you can sometimes just catch someone on a bad day and I try and be forgiving of that. Uh, um, so, yeah, I'd say, look, if you can be 80, 90% congruent, I think you're doing well. You're doing well. And with that, and then putting yourself out there, I think there's this need for recognition. Like you often talk about needing to be loved and appreciated. Please um, love me. Please <laughs> love me. I need your love. Now, recently I've realised I've been pushing that away for so long. What, recognition? Recognition, love, relationship, that kind of thing. And... You do know I don't do marriage advice. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm nowhere near. <laughs> do not want marriage advice. It's more the, the that desire for recognition and to be. Isn't it a human need? Needed. I think and it, wanted. Where does um, it come from for you? Um. So, so I think that um, importance is one of the major human mm -hmm. needs. Um, I'm sure it must be Mad Maslow's hierarchy of needs somewhere. So. You asked where it came from me, but you were also talking about it generically. I don't think there's anything wrong with getting your needs met mm -hmm. because human beings have needs. And to live a fulfilling life, to fill yourself full, you need to meet your needs. I think as long as you're self-aware of the needs that you have and you seek them in the right way, i.e. ethically, um, giving as well as taking in a balanced fashion, I see no problem. I think people's individual needs are linked both to their vision and values but also their voids so um values the things that we value the most in life are often maybe always in fact linked to voids mm -hmm. so why does money become important to a lot of people because they don't perceive they have enough why would a billionaire keep chasing money maybe they perceive they want more mm -hmm. because they're competing against other billionaires now by the way to some people money isn't a driver I mean, it was just an example but often, our, the things we desire the most come from our voids. Why does someone hit the gym every day? Because they want to look better. And when they look better, what do they want to look better? Um, and, and the value goes away once the void is full. So once someone perceives they have enough money, they're going to stop striving to make it. Once they perceive that they're in good enough shape, they're going to um, probably stop training as much. You know, when you can always see when someone's like... Um, found a partner you know they go to the gym they train twice a day they're single you can tell when they found a partner because they're at the gym once a week and they start to put on the weight and, yep. uh, the cake. yeah exactly <laughs> uh, because voids are um, voids are a driver um so now taking the question to me i think um my need for importance or um what were the words you used recognition yeah recognition, recognition. so they come from being an overweight kid 
um, and maybe not feeling like I got recognition, adulation, praise, even being noticed. I didn't really feel I was even noticed. Um, and certainly growing up with girls and friendship circles and stuff like that. So that, that burned quite a hole in my soul, which I still need to fill to this day. I feel like I manage it better. I feel like I get recognition in the right ways, i.e. Um, doing good things for people, writing books, doing podcasts, doing lives, doing public speeches, all of that. They meet my needs. I mean, reviews on my books when they're good, standing ovations at talks when they're good. They make me feel important, but they're also um, value to society. So what I've tried to do is embrace my failings and fears and you know, vulnerabilities as a human being and get my needs met through my work, you know, my art, my books, my podcasts, everything else. Um, and, and I think I'm doing okay. And occasionally I get a bit needy, um, but that's only really when I'm getting a lot of attack from all over the place. Um, and I've had that the last sort of two or three months in a lot of different areas of my life. So I have felt a little bit needy, but I've also learned that it's okay to be needy. And I'm kind of good at asking for it. Like if I've, if I've got a need, yep. I'll just ask for it. And I think when people are waiting for other people to notice them, but they're not asking them, that was me when I was a kid. Yeah. You know, wanting to play football with all the other kids, but they wouldn't let me because I was fat. Wanting to sort of get involved with the girls a bit, but they didn't really notice me because I was fat. And I'd never ask and I'd always wish. Um, but now I'll say to my business partner or my MD or, you, you know, like my kids or whoever, and I'll basically just say, look, I'm here, notice me a bit, come on, say some good things about me. And I don't need a lot, and then I kind of feel energised again. But one thing I do know about that, the most important person that you need that from is yourself. Yep. And um, I'm, I'm pretty good at beating myself up, and I've had to learn to get better at lifting myself up. And I have this little rule now, if I beat myself down, I must lift myself up. And if I'm criticising myself, I must also give myself praise. And I've tried to catch myself out doing things well because I'm, many entrepreneurs are like this. When you strive for better, 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 never-ending improvement, all we often do is look at what didn't work or what we're not good at or what we need to improve. Um, and yeah, I've had long enough times beating myself up. So now it's time to uh, do a bit more lifting myself up. But then you need the balance because I've definitely got overconfident or complacent because things have been going well. Then you often have an event that brings you back into balance. So it's really like, getting those needs met in a positive, productive way that works for you and works for society. I'd say that's where you win in that. You know, because if you're too needy, people don't like it. No. Nope. And if you're getting your needs met hurting others, that's obviously going to push people away from you. Um, so for me, it's just like when I feel this big emptiness, I'll write a book, I'll do a podcast, uh, you know, I'll create a product because I know that I put the work out and I get the praise and the recognition. I know that'll make me feel good. And, and I think it's okay to admit that. A lot of people go, oh, I don't do it for any of the recognition or the praise or the rewards. I just do it for the, for the art itself. Yeah. But you've got to get something out of doing the art, the business, it, okay, the money or the profit or um, the gratitude from the clients, whatever it is, there's got to be some benefit. Otherwise, why are you doing it? Wait, exactly. I feel like that sometimes. Like I do all of this stuff and I'm not getting recognised. And I feel that I do a lot and there should be more of that. And then I think, well, am I getting it? And then I go look for it. So that's why I put on my one day event and people want to come and spend the day with me. That makes me feel good. Yeah, and that's great. It's a difficult one, feeling like you're doing enough and you're not getting the recognition you mm. deserve because I'm a big believer in you get what you deserve, i.e. you're getting what you're getting based on what you've done. So um, what might happen is there's just a lag or a delay. If you feel like you've been working hard for months and months and months, and the results and the recognition aren't there. They're just not there yet because you're growing the roots of your seed mm -hmm. and the tree only starts growing once the roots are all grown. So it's, it's important to be patient uh, and it's important not to let that feeling of not being recognised or out there enough or enough leads or clients or whatever is your measure. Mm -hmm. It's important not to be too impatient and to sabotage it because you're expecting it to happen too quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I sometimes feel like with the amount of podcasts I've done, and the quality of my content, I should have more listeners. But I've got the amount of listeners that I've got, and that's what I deserve. And I have to have faith that in a week or a month or a year, I'm going to get this massive spike because someone important is going to recognise me and share my work or whatever. Or I'm going to get the big TV show because I've done loads of pilots and many of them haven't come off. Some have. 
And you just have to keep having faith that that big moment that, or, or that compounded moment, because sometimes it's not one big moment. It's just a combination of lots of small moments over time. So I think it's important not to get into that mindset of I should be better, I should be more, I deserve this. Follow process, the outcome will come. Yeah. Because I think that feeling of deserving and not getting, it can be all-consuming and people just, they, they stop. And then I think when you stop, that's when your confidence stops and then nothing else grows beyond that. Yeah, well, well you wouldn't plant a seed and, 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 and give yeah. up on it before you saw the... The shoots, because you know the roots are growing. Yeah. Um, Bill Gates says you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. So, you know, you get what you work for, you get what you negotiate, you get what you put out there. Um, he's a, and I'm a big believer in that as well. But there's a lag, that's the problem. You don't get the results today of the work you do today. Right. Sometimes it's tomorrow, but sometimes it's in a, a month, a year or, or longer. So... Um, yeah, and uh, Mel here has just said, avoid the minefield of expectation. This is mm-hmm. a good point. The, the, further, the, the bigger the gap between reality and your expectation, the more unhappiness, unfulfillment, depression, anxiety, frustration is going to kick in. So sometimes if one is too high in expectation, bringing your expectations back a bit, I'm not saying settle because you don't have to settle, but bringing your expectations about a bit, back a bit and just having a smaller gap between where you really are and where you perceive you should be, I think it's good to have some gap mm-hmm. because that's a motivator and you're driving towards something. But too big a gap is really demotivating. So that is a good point about uh, managing your expectations and being realistic about them. Realistic but still dreaming big and wanting more, I think. Is well, I think, I think everything exists in a paradox in life. Um, you know, so think big, start small. You can't just have this massive thing up here because it's just, it's just impossible. You have to build upon building up on, upon on. Yeah. And on and on and on. Yeah. And on and on. Yeah. Cool. So, what was the last thing that you learned? That no one's perfect and it's okay to make a mistake. And if you make a mistake, even if you don't think the mistake was all you... Go and apologise for the mistake and make it right and move on. And that happened about an, an hour ago. And I knew that already. But sometimes people are like, oh, well, uh, you know, if you, if you know something, then you, sh- yeah. you know it and you should never make a mistake. But everybody makes mistakes. And even the things I know I know best and I know I'm best at, I still make mistakes at them every now and again. And I did something I've not done in 10 years and I'm really proud that I've not done it in 10 years. And I suppose doing it today made me realise that I haven't done it for 10 years and that's really good, but I did it today and it was nothing major, but also I didn't stew on it. I went and I fixed it. And um, I think that's the important thing is knowing that and fixing it. Because if you don't fix the thing that you've done, then you really have done something wrong. I think that's a worse mistake. Yeah. If John De Martin, Martin, if John De Martini was sat here in the middle of us, one, it'd be cosy. Um, Wouldn't but it? <laughs> yeah, if, if he was sat in the middle of us, he'd be like, there are no such thing as mistakes. Everything is how it should be. You know, a very zen-like attitude. So I realise in the mistakes that we make, they were meant to be and there's something to learn from them. Uh, and I think that... I think humility and, and managing ego is about being able to admit when you're wrong fixing something even if you perceive it's not yours to fix or being the first person to reach out to fix the issue and I try and practice that as much as I can um, but you know we've all got shit going on in our lives yep. and sometimes you just have too much shit and you lose your shit and then when you calm down go and fix your shit yep. and it seems to be lose your shit fix your shit lose your shit fix your shit you write a book on that yeah lose your <laughs> shit fix your shit repeat um, yeah cool. no regrets but uh, yeah I lost my call cool a bit today and it's not something I normally do oh, well well done for admitting that <laughs> <laughs> it's not always an easy thing to do to admit when you're wrong so. um, I'm pretty good at that because yeah. I make so many fucking mistakes <laughs> it's like I have to um, I have got a lot better at that because look People will judge you anyway, so just to say and do the right things. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So in terms of confidence, what does it really mean to you and how does it make you feel? And don't just say confident. Uh, so confidence is a mix of proof 
that you can do something well and belief that you're good enough. And a lot of people are looking for proof based on, um, sorry, a lot of people are looking for confidence based on proof, i.e. I'll be confident when I've done or got A, B and C. But human beings have the amazing capacity to do genius-like things all the time and mir make miracles happen in normal and extraordinary areas of life. If you think about all the things human beings have achieved and all the feats human beings. Um, so believing in yourself is actually about believing in humanity. And if you believe anybody else can do something special, then so can you because you're a human being. So to that end, confidence is also faith. It's faith in you as a human being your ability to step up to a higher level of greatness. And you can tap into humanity in general to do that by being inspired by other people who've done the same. And I love having mentors because what they've achieved inspires me and then inspires me to be a greater me. So no, confidence isn't just being confident. It's pursuing something and getting to a level of mastery at it better than others because that's the comparison frame. It's not about I'm better than you, but it's like, oh, okay, well, this is the benchmark. I'm here and you're there. I've got that belt, you've got that belt. I'm at a higher level, so I feel confident. And the faith in yourself that you can do it because you have amazing resources and capacities as a human. And if I haven't got any experience, I'm really struggling for confidence. It's that latter one that's really important to remember. I think that's important for everyone to remember. It's not just... I'm a confident person, I have this, I do workshops with people and one, I did this little exercise of come and do your elevator pitch, come up on the stage with me and these three guys, they came up and they were terrified and they said after, I thought I was confident but doing that made me feel really anxious, I didn't want to do it but I did it anyway because you, you made me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not just in one thing, you might feel it in one area but like you said earlier, it's transmutable. There's a massive myth around confidence, yeah. and that is that this person is confident, that person is not confident. I am not confident, they are confident. Like, people are blessed with omnipotent confidence or zero confidence. It's not true. Um, if you look at any human being, and I would say any human being, something they've honoured, learned, studied and mastered, even if they're an introvert, even if their confidence socially is at the lowest, you will see them change, their body posture will change. You know, if you think about the, the geeky coder, you know, who probably isn't that socially um, confident, but you give them a couple of Red Bulls, a keyboard, and they're like, right, leave me alone for, for 72 hours. I'm going to go and hack into the CIA or I'm going to write this massive algorithm and, and, and solve big problems. And they come to life. And I think that's really important to remember. If you ever hear yourself saying, I'm not confident, correct yourself. Because the reality is, I'm not yet confident in this area of my life. But I am confident in this area, in this area, and that could be transmuted across. Yeah. So no one is carte blanche confident. No one is carte blanche whatever the opposite of confidence is. We're all, you know, what we've learned, studied, mastered, what we enjoy, where we've, where we've had good feedback and recognition, we're confident. Yep. And if there are any areas that you're not confident in, you can come to my one-day event on the 4th of October. <laughs> Can't they, Rob? I guess, I guess they can. <laughs> Should we leave that there, then? Yeah. Yeah? Cool. Yeah. All um, good? Yeah. Oh, one more question. Yeah, far away. Um, what would you name your yacht? Should you have a yacht? I don't like water and I don't like boats. That's not what I asked. And that's, that's probably lucky for me, because <laughs> I'd probably have to buy a ridiculously expensive one. Um, I'd call it Ariana. After my daughter. Oh, you're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. And then I call my speedboat disruptive. <laughs> <laughs> Would it go into a, a, a door in the yacht? So you'd have to have a really yeah. big yacht with the... Yeah. 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 Proper one. Yeah. Cool. It's the only thing that's going in my daughter. <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you think. <laughs> on that note. <laughs> All right, great. Cool. Thanks very much. Thanks, Natalie. Okay. And uh, remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.